Hello and welcome to this fourth chapter of this introduction to Arduino. In this chapter we'll talk a little more about the Arduino hardware, briefly explore the Arduino software, and share an example of applying Ohm's law to a simple circuit for the protection of an LED. This is the fourth chapter in a 10-part series developed for a local hackerspace here in Tucson. Some of the examples and screenshots I'll be sharing from this point forward are associated with the manual that comes with the Arduino Ultimate Starter Kit offered by the company Vilrose and are used with permission. The free software available for programming your Arduino is available via the website shown on this slide. In order to download the software, please follow the download link. When you select the download link, you'll see the options for downloading the software for your specific OS, either Windows, Mac, or Linux. If you're running Windows, I recommend using the installer, since that will ensure Windows from versions XP up to 10 will install the necessary drivers automatically to help your OS recognize the official release of your Arduino board. Once your software is installed, go ahead and launch it. You'll see a splash screen like the one shown to the right of the arrow while the program loads. Once your program launches, it will automatically open up a blank sketch used for programming your Arduino. A sketch is essentially a program that instructs your Arduino how to sense and react to its environment and or control things like motors, LCD displays, or other interesting things you can connect to your board. Before we discuss the elements of a sketch, note that uploading your code requires that you correctly specify what kind of board you have and what port it's stationed on. Both these options are available under the Tools menu. Keep in mind that if your port or hardware are not specified correctly, your program may not work as expected or may not even load your Arduino at all. On that note, let's talk briefly about how to set up these parameters. First, we're going to have to specify the kind of hardware we're using. For this introduction, I've recommended that you use an official Arduino Uno R3 board. That parameter is available under the Tools Board option. Just make sure that the Arduino Genuino Uno is selected and checked. Next, you'll want to specify the port your Arduino is plugged into. Make sure your Arduino is connected to your computer via USB cable before checking this. On my system, which is a Mac that runs OS X, you'll see an option that includes the quote Arduino Genuino Uno text. Use that one. Now, if you're using a clone, it may not be readily identified as Arduino Genuino. In this case, use the port that includes the text dev cu.usb modem. That will usually be the port connected to your microcontroller via a USB. And this is a screenshot of the same options available under a Windows operating system. Again, there's my Arduino Genuino Uno option. Note that in Windows, the ports are identified as COM ports. If you're using a clone, your hardware may not be obviously recognizable, so you may have to check a few of the ports while trying to upload your code until you find the one that works. The language used to program your Arduino is very similar to C++ and is not difficult to learn at all. I won't go too much into programming in this chapter, but we'll share some important elements that will help you get started with your first sketch. To start with, you'll notice a comment at the top of the sketch that, that reads, put your global variables here. This is the part of your code where you'll want to define variables that you want to have accessible throughout the rest of your code, hence the term global variables. By creating global variables, we're talking about creating a place in memory to store data that's accessible from anywhere else in your code. You'll also notice two blocks in your blank sketch called setup and loop. Let's start with setup. The setup block will contain code that your Arduino will run only once when it's first turned on. This block lets you define starting values for your variables. Your Arduino will run the code in the setup block right when you power up your board. Now the loop section of your code is where the work actually gets done. Here you will list out the instructions you want your Arduino to run while it remains on. Your Arduino will run those instructions until it reaches the end of the block and then will return to the top of the block and execute those instructions all over again. Your Arduino will repeat this loop until you turn it off or it runs out of power. This makes Arduinos very useful since they can do the most mundane tasks without complaining as long as you supply them with power. We'll write some code in a few minutes, but first take notice of this checkmark button in the upper left hand corner of your sketch. Once your code is complete, click on this button when you want the compiler to check your code for errors. The software will then check for anything that wouldn't make sense to the Arduino, and if it finds it, we'll flag it for you to review and correct. 
Now, if your code has no errors, you can click on the arrow button, which will instruct the software to upload the code to your microcontroller. For good measure, the software will try compiling your code one last time to double check. And if nothing has changed and there are no errors, it will upload your code to the microcontroller connected to your computer using the parameters we already set up under the Tools menu options. So let's take a break from the software end of things and take a closer look at the hardware. At the heart of the Arduino is this ATmega 328P microcontroller. This is the brains that will store and process the code, sensor data, and communications with hardware that's attached to our socket headers. And this is a close-up of the little microcontroller that's attached to that Arduino board that runs that program over and over and over again. And if I flip that microcontroller over, you can see these tiny little pins. And what happens is your code interfaces with these pins by powering them on or off or detecting whether a positive or negative charge is connected to each one. And as we mentioned earlier, your Arduino includes rows of socket headers, which are connected to those tiny microcontroller pins, making it easy to plug sensors or other components to the ATmega328 quickly uh, via the Arduino hardware. So let's say I wanted to flash an LED that's connected to a designated pin on my Arduino. How would I go about doing that? Well, there are several ways to hook up an LED to our Arduino, but this one's fairly intuitive as copied from the Vilro starter kit manual that I mentioned earlier. For starters, I'm going to remove the red wire since it's not really needed for this particular sketch. We have the positive terminal of our LED hooked up to pin 13 of our Arduino. Note that the positive end of the LED is the one with the longest leg, and you're going to want to make sure that you insert this correctly in your breadboard or you will burn out your LED. We can attach the negative end of the LED to the ground rail on the breadboard through a 330 ohm resistor as shown in the diagram. And finally, the ground rail is hooked up to one of the ground socket headers on the Arduino as shown on this drawing with the black wire. Please note that you can use any of the sockets labeled as GND for your breadboard ground rail hookup. There's more than one and any one of them will work. And now we can start using some of the water metaphor terms that we presented in chapter one to explain how the code works with our Arduino. To start with, in my setup block, I'll initialize pin 13 to be an output. Think of this as initiating the pin on that tiny little microcontroller hooked up to socket header with the number 13 and telling the Arduino that we want that pin to be a switch or a valve that can pressurize current or flow to my LED. In my loop block, I'll turn the power for that pin number 13 on high, which is the same as opening the valve. I can then tell the Arduino to wait for 500 milliseconds and then turn the power for that pin off or low, which is the same as closing the valve and waiting another 500 milliseconds. So when I upload my code to the Arduino, the first thing it's gonna do is go to that setup block and note that pin 13 is defined as an output pin, which is the same thing as calling it a water valve if we were to compare it to our water analogy. When we go to the loop part of the program, the first thing the program is gonna do is set that output pin to high, which is the same thing as turning that water valve on, which is going to allow current to flow through that pin, through the LED, and to ground. That's gonna turn my LED on. The next command is essentially to wait 500 milliseconds and then set that output pin to low, which is gonna turn the valve off, eliminate the flow of current, and turn my LED off. It's going to then do the same thing over again. It's going to turn that LED on by setting pin 13 high, turn it off by setting pin 13 low, and then it's going to go to the top of the loop and it's going to start executing this loop over and over and over again until I remove power from the board. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, this time we're gonna actually trace the flow of the current through the wires. So here we can see digital write 13 high, and what that's gonna do 
is essentially allow that pin 13 valve to open, which is going to allow current to flow through the wire, through the LED, turning it on, and then allowing that current to go to ground. Next, the program is going to tell pin 13 to go low, which is the same as turning the power off. And when that happens, we have no current flow through the LED, so the LED goes dark. Then we set it high again after 500 milliseconds. Our LED turns on. And then pin 13 goes low again, essentially turning the LED off. Now, when I was first getting started with, uh, with these sketches and wiring, um, this really didn't make sense to me. I didn't, I didn't really understand the flow of current. Um, I hope that the explanation that I, uh, that I provided makes that a little clearer now. But the other thing that really bothered me were these little resistors that were downstream of these LEDs. And I didn't really know what their purpose was. And really, it, it ties into Ohm's Law, which is the reason why we spent uh, two chapters going over the same. Uh, in order to be able to explain the significance of that resistor for protecting your LED. So in order to understand the, the relevance of Ohm's law and that resistor, um, we really need to look at the spec sheet for the LED. So this is a standard spec sheet for most LEDs, like the one that's included in the Vilros kit. And here you can see that LEDs typically tolerate up to 20 milliamps of current, uh, which is the same as two one hundredths of an amp. We can also see from the spec sheet that LEDs will typically drop about two volts across them. That's, that's what they require to light up. So here's the data for my LED summarized from the spec sheet. And this led to a question, and that was, how do I verify that an Arduino Uno digital pin can supply enough voltage and current to power an LED? Say I didn't know that, that, that they could, and I was just kind of curious about it. Well, what you can do is you can look up the specs for these Arduino digital pins as well. And here they are. Specifically, um, when a digital pin is set to high in your code, it allows the Arduino to supply up to 40 milliamps of current at 5 volts of current pressure for short periods of time. And you can also draw 20 milliamps safely for extended periods of time. So the answer is yes, that Arduino pin according to the specifications it carries, can meet the specifications for powering the LED. Coming back to our blink sketch and circuit, now we have enough information to explain why resistors are relevant. Here, we have to select a resistor to ensure that only two volts of pressure is dropped across the LED. We chose two volts as a good number since the specification sheet for LEDs indicates the maximum voltage should be no more than 2.2 volts. We need a resistor since the pressure provided by our Arduino pin is 5 volts. So we can use Ohm's law to help us determine the value for a resistor that will share that 5 volt pressure drop and ensure that only two of the five available volts drops across the LED. But before we do that, what do you think would happen if we remove the resistor from our circuit and just replaced it with a wire. In this case, since there are no other loads to share the voltage, the entire five volts provided by the Arduino pin must be completely taken up by the LED. This will induce a voltage drop above the maximum 2.2 volts indicated in the specification sheet, which in turn will induce more current flow through the LED. This sets up a perfect storm that will ensure the LED will burn very brightly for a few milliseconds, and subsequently just burn itself out. So let's come back to this example and try to determine what value resistor I should use in this circuit. If I know the voltage drop I want across my LED should be no more than two volts, that means that the resistor is gonna to have to take up the remaining three volts. Next, if the desired highest current draw of the LED is 20 milliamps or two hundredths of an amp, what resistance should I select to ensure no more than 20 milliamps of current flow? And this is where Ohm's law comes into play. From our visual mnemonic, we know that voltage is equal to current times resistance. Now we have two of these variables, the voltage drop across the resistor, which is three volts, and the current that we want flowing through the LED, which is 20 milliamps. 
Looking at the mnemonic, we can see that resistance is equal to voltage over current. So, if we substitute the respective numbers, we can see that we get a resistance of 150 ohms to realize a 20 milliamp current flow with a 3 volt drop across the resistor. But wait a minute, the kit that came with this drawing asked me to use a resistor with a value of 330 ohms. Why not 150 ohms like I just calculated? Well, we can try to figure out what's going on by calculating the resulting current when using the resistor that's included with the Vilros kit at 330 ohms. So, using our visual mnemonic, we can see that current is equal to voltage over resistance. Since we are now using a resistor with a value of 330 ohms, we can substitute that value along with a voltage drop of 3 volts into the equation for current and see that this drops our current down to 9 milliamps. This is much lower than the rated value for the LED and the reason they probably selected this higher value resistor was to ensure that the LED wasn't always burning at its brightest, thus shortening its life. Finally, remember that current will be the same anywhere in a simple circuit. So if we have the voltage drop and resistance of one component, we can calculate the resulting current through the entire simple circuit. Thanks for watching. See you next time. What makes the lightning? It's a story in rhyme Where the negatives and the positives make the heaven shine They were separated then